have a very fine speaker this uh, this month, and I didn't realize how great until I looked at his his profile uh, and his biography. Mr. Carl Lutzel Schwab, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correct, Carl, because that's that's a mouthful. Is it Lutzel Schwab? Well, we pronounce it Litzel. I guess it's been Americanized a bit. Okay, Litzel Schwab. That's actually yep. easier to pronounce. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, Carl is K9LA, and he started his radio career uh, as a shortwave listener in the 1950s. And many people in the 1950s, you know, started their career that way. And he received his novice license, WN9AVT, in October of 1961 and selected K9LA in 1977. He is an electrical engineering graduate from Purdue University. Congratulations, Mr. Boilermaker. And uh, was an RF design engineer for Motorola and Magnavox Raytheon until his retirement in 2013. He enjoys propagation research, DXing. He's at the top of the honor roll, contesting, and he was the editor for uh, NCJ is the National Contest Journal. Yes. Okay. Uh, from 2002 to 2007, and he was experimenting antennas with antennas and restoring used uh, vintage equipment. Both he and his wife, uh, Vicky, AE9YL, they enjoy traveling, and they've done some de expeditions to Syria in 2001, Market wow. Reef in 2002, uh, numerous trips to, uh, to ZF Land, that's New Zealand, and their calls are ZF2YL and Carl is ZF2LA. He received the Bill Orr W6SAI Technical Writing Award, the Yasme Foundation Excellence Award, the Indian Indiana Radio Club Council Technical Expertise Award, and he's written many propagation columns for World Radio and the National Contest Journal. He's written on solar and propagation articles in amateur radio publications, and he was the lead author in the recent update of the CQ Shortwave Propagation Handbook, the fourth edition. Uh, he's also the vice, was the vice director of the ARRL Central Division from 2017 to 2021, and now serves as director of the Central Division and is on several of his committees. So Carl, thank you very much for, for uh, honoring us with your uh, your presentation this evening. Okay, thank you, Patrick, for the nice introduction and hello to everyone out there. Uh, Fort Wayne, like I said, is pretty far west in the eastern time zone, so it doesn't take us too long to get to central, but we're eastern, and uh, eh, that's okay. <laughs> uh, I think we should really be in central, but that's okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Let me uh, get, I see you made me a co-host, so I should be able to bring my uh, screen up. There it is. Let's see, share, okay. <clears throat> so I don't know how it'll take a little bit to probably come up over there. Anyone who's not muted yet, please go ahead and do so. Okay, it's up uh, full screen on my laptop, so hopefully you can see it. It looks good. Okay. So I got to ask, uh, how many of you ever had one of the Heath, Heath Gets Sixers? Anybody? You can unmute and say yes if you did. <laughs> uh, not me. <laughs> No, nobody? Okay, well, that's the way it goes, I guess. I had a tour, but uh, since we're talking about uh, mostly about six meter stuff, I thought I'd throw that image on there. There's my email, and uh, there's my website, which has a lot of propagation stuff and some aviation stuff too. But the title is Cycle 25 and VHF UHF Propagation. So uh, that was a great introduction, Patrick. My first license in radio was really with Popular Electronics uh, as an SWL, shortwave listener. I was WPE9BQH in the late 50s. So <laughs> then that led to uh, ham radio. That was great. 
you covered everything else. There's a, one of my vintage stations. It's a Viking Ranger 2 and a Drake 2B. It was a great station back in the early 60s, and uh, it's still pretty good right now for CW. It also does, uh, the, the, uh, the Ranger does six meters, but the 2B doesn't. So I could probably build a little converter and I can put that, that station on six meters. Okay, uh, quickly talk about which VHF, UHF bands are affected by solar cycles. A quick update on cycle 25. Uh, the many modes of six meter propagation. Uh, it's an interesting topic and uh, you'll see why in, a, in a, a little bit down the road here. Talk about some antenna uh, con considerations for six meters and then give a list of references for six meter stuff. <clears throat> of course, I can't put every reference in the whole wild world on there. So uh, I put the ones that seem uh, to come up a lot. So what bands, what, what, which of the bands are affected? Well, <clears throat> there, there's two things that we need to make a QSO. One is the maximum usable frequency has to be high enough to refract the signal back to earth. And what that simply means is there's gotta be enough ionization generally in the F2 region for six meters, um, for normal six meters. And of course, uh, having enough ionization to bend the signal back to earth is most important on the higher HF bands, which uh, 15, 12, 10 meters and six meters. And then in addition to that, in addition to the signal being able to get to the uh, target location, the, the ionospheric absorption or the loss has to be low enough to allow the signal to be heard. Now, <clears throat> absorption is inversely proportional to the square of the frequency. So that means on six meters, uh, ionospheric absorption is extremely low. So it's nothing we really have to worry about on six meters. Uh, for a sideband, uh, the signal needs to, be about, needs to be about 10 dB above your noise level. For CW, the signal needs to be around your noise level. For the digital modes, the signal can be below your noise level. And of course, how much below the noise level uh, a digital signal can decode depends on which specific digital mode. Uh, <clears throat> you know, JT65 is one of the best. Uh, FT4 is one of the worst, but they still uh, offer an advantage over CW. And in fact, uh, I did a little experiment and FT8 has about a 9 dB advantage over my ability to copy CW. So a uh, signal 9 dB down from a CW signal can be decoded by FT8. And that's pretty interesting. It uh, really <clears throat> explains a lot why <clears throat> uh, FT8 has just uh, taken off and uh, pretty much uh, dominates the, uh, the world here. <clears throat> okay, so what is the MUF? Well, that's the highest frequency that is refracted back to earth over a given distance at a given time. Uh, so it's uh, very, it's variable. It depends on the time, the season, where we are in a solar cycle. And the bands that are affected by a solar cycle are uh, 630. That's, uh, <coughs> uh, let's see, 630 meters. That's about 475 kilohertz, I believe. 160 meters is affected. <coughs> in the lower bands, uh, 80, 60, and 40, they're best at solar minimum due to less ionospheric absorption, which is less loss. <clears throat> the higher bands, 15, 12, and 10, and six meters, are best around solar maximum due to the higher MUFs, which means there's more ionization, and therefore those frequencies can be refracted back to Earth. Now, there are a couple bands that, well, there's probably a whole bunch of them, <laughs> uh, not affected by a solar cycle. 2200 meters at 137, 137 kilohertz is rarely affected. And that's because uh, a signal at 137 kilohertz doesn't get very high into the ionosphere. In fact, it's uh, kind of refracted uh, below the D region. So there's very little loss. And that explains why Loran C was down at 100 kilohertz. Uh, it can travel uh, around the world with very low loss 
and it's kind of immune to any solar disturbances. Um, uh, two meters, of course, uh, is rarely affected by a solar cycle. And that in also includes uh, anything, any frequencies higher than two meters. So what we're gonna focus on, like I said before, is six meters. <clears throat> okay, cycle 25 status. Uh, there's me trying to order some sunspots, but like a lot of other things, uh, they're on back order. Maybe one of these days we'll, we'll get them. They're starting to pick up though, so that's good. Here's recorded history. In other words, all previous 24 solar cycles. And what you're looking at is a plot of the maximum smooth sunspot number of all the previous 24 solar cycles. Uh, I highlighted cycle 19. That's the largest in recorded history. Uh, of course, uh, before uh, our recorded history, there could be bigger cycles, but we just don't have enough data to say if that's right or say if that's true or not. Uh, what's really obvious by that plot is we've been through three periods of big cycles, okay? Uh, the big cycles were one, two, three, four, eight, nine, 10, 11, and ooh, 17 through 23, okay? Uh, note that uh, cycle 17 through 23 included uh, uh, the, the solar cycles of our lifetime. So we were blessed with that, with having very good uh, higher frequency conditions. Now, along with those three periods of big cycles, we've been through two periods of small cycles. Cycles four, uh, five, six, and seven were quite small. <laughs> Cycle 12 through uh, 16 were small, a little bit bigger than uh, five, six, and seven, but still uh, down from the, uh, the three big periods. And then cycle 24. Um, Cycle 24 was the smallest in our lifetimes, and it's the fourth smallest in recorded history. Uh, cycle 5, Cycle 6, and Cycle 14 were smaller than Cycle 24. So that's the big question. Will Cycle 25 get us out of this third period of small cycles? Uh, or is it going to keep us in? Uh, is it going to last for several solar cycles? All I can say right now is we're gonna have to wait and see. Now, <clears throat> there are many predictions for cycle 25. I'm aware of 56. Why are there so many? It's because we don't fully understand how sunspots are generated. Now, why are sunspots important? Well, around the area where a sunspot emerges, there, uh, uh, that's where the extreme ultraviolet radiation from the sun comes from. So when there's more sunspots, there's more extreme ultraviolet radiation, which ionizes the F2 region, which is the region uh, mostly responsible for our long distance contacts and also the ones on the higher HF bands and six meters. Now, <clears throat> uh, you can see, for example, that uh, there's one prediction for uh, cycle 25 having a smooth sunspot between 25 and 49. And you can see where all the other <laughs> 55 predictions fall. Now, 50 of those 56 predictions, that's 89%, are for a below average solar cycle. And I've indicated uh, which bucket the uh, average cycle falls into. Uh, an average, the average of all the previous 24 cycles is 179. So it falls into the 175 to 199 bucket. So there's pretty much a consensus among solar scientists that uh, we're gonna have a small cycle. That doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna come true. The sun will do whatever it wants to do, not what we expect it to do. Um, cycle 24, we had about the same number of predictions. And it shows that uh, we, we still haven't learned all the nitty gritty details to be able to uh, predict a cycle with uh, you know 100% certain, <clears throat> certainty. So there's just many different methods to predict cycles. Uh, 
you can see that there are three predictions for an average solar cycle. Yeah, we'll take that if it happens. <laughs> There's uh, one for a uh, somewhat bigger than average solar cycle. And then there's two for uh, uh, really big solar cycles. Now, uh, maybe you've heard of Dr. Scott McIntosh. Um, <clears throat> he and his colleagues made a prediction in June 2020 uh, that uh, it was going to be about 229. And that's one of the two there in that 225 to 250 bucket. But something that they expected to happen about a year and a half ago didn't happen. And it did happen a, a couple months ago. And they've revised their prediction down to an average cycle. So uh, we're, we're just going to have to wait and see what happens. Predictions are great, but uh, real data is really what's important. And speaking of real data, Here's the data on cycle 25. That's the thick red curve, solid red curve. Uh, we now have 23 months of smooth sunspot number data. And you can see that uh, cycle 25 is ascending, making it, its ascent, ascent. Now, 23 months is about half of uh, the rise time of an average cycle, which is about four years, four years. So we're we're about halfway we're probably about halfway to the maximum of cycle 25. Uh, so uh, the green plot is cycle 24. Remember uh, that it's the smallest in our lifetime and uh, the fourth smallest in recorded history. Orange is an average cycle, like cycle 23 was average. And the blue curve is the a moderately big cycle 21. So think about you know what you, what you see where the red cycle where the red curve is. Compare it to the green, orange, and blue. And uh, so where do you think cycle 25 is headed? Uh, to me, it, I, th I think it's going to be a small cycle, but that kind of depends what it does in the next six to 12 months. It, maybe it's going to start accelerating and things will get bigger and hit the average. And of course, that'll help uh, six meters if we have a cycle like cycle 23 as opposed to one like 24. <clears throat> okay, the many modes of six meter propagation I mentioned there, <laughs> it's kind of interesting. So I put together a little chart here that shows all the six meter modes. I think I got all of them. And I divided them up into uh, those that had nothing to do with the atmosphere or the ionosphere, it's line of sight and ground wave. Uh, modes that depended on the atmosphere alone, tropospheric scatter, tropospheric ducting, uh, uh, SSSP, we'll get into that later, meteor scatter. That's all uh, atmospheric type stuff. Now, ionospheric, of course, has the, the biggest uh, number. It goes from aurora uh, through sporadic E, through TEP, which is trans-equatorial propagation, and also skewed paths. And then there's also uh, extraterrestrial uh, moon bounce. I thought about putting in, uh, you know, reflecting off a UFO, but nah, I didn't want to get too wild here. So what we're going to do... I have a slide for each of those, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on some of them. Uh, what I plan to do, Patrick, is uh, send you a PDF of this presentation. So for those who want to go through it more slowly, they can do that. And they can look at the slides that I'll probably skip over quickly. So line of sight. Well, that's basically based on how high your antenna is and how high the other station's antenna is. And unfortunately, it doesn't really include obstructions to the horizon. So uh, it may be a little bit less than that formula says, but uh, if you got both antennas are at about 40 feet, then uh, you should have about uh, 18 miles line of sight propagation. 
What about ground wave on six meters? Normally, you don't think about that. Normally, you think about 160 or the AM broadcast band and 160. Um, but there's a program out there by uh, uh, one of the uh, departments under the, inter the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union. And it's called GR wave. And you can predict what, uh, how, how far GR wave should go. And uh, on six meters, it should do about 60 miles. Now, I have no idea if that GR wave program or how accurate it is. So uh, just take that 60 miles or so with a grain of salt. And that plot kind of shows uh, how far away the signal would be down to an S9. And it's about, mm, it looks like about 34 miles. So I uh, extended a little bit more down to the noise floor of a receiver, uh, kind of. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> 60 miles probably seems to be a good number. Like I said, I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, it's probably in the ballpark. How about tropospheric scatter? <clears throat> that's an interesting mode. There was an article uh, way back in uh, 1957 in the March QST by W2NNT, and he can, uh, you can uh, use that article and use that chart, that little chart on the right, uh, to figure out how many miles you should be able to get. Uh, and of course, K1JT has the Q65 software for uh, tropospheric scatter. And if you have a, a kilowatt in uh, two antennas with 14 dBi gain, and that's probably typical of a, like a four element Yagi uh, overground. That gives about 100 miles, okay, uh, with a received signal strength or a signal power of minus 126 uh, dBm. So uh, you should be able to hear that with a good preamp in front of your receiver. So that's something to play with if you're interested in tropospheric scatter. <clears throat> tropospheric ducting. Uh, that has to do with uh, uh, an inversion in the troposphere. In other words, uh, as you start at ground level and go higher in altitude, the temperature starts decreasing until you hit the tropopause and then it starts going up again. Now, what can happen before you hit the tropopause is uh, the temperature can go up and then go back down. And that's indicated there in, uh, on that uh, plot on the left. And there's, there, there's a way on the right, there's the inversion depth, typically about 200 meters. That's what a typical uh, uh, temperature inversion is. Uh, what you need for six meters, though, is around 450 kilometers. Okay, so you need quite a bit more, but that seems to uh, be able to happen. Uh, have some pretty good... Uh, results from, uh, in fact, uh, something within the past year that probably it was tropospheric ducting that uh, made the QSO. <clears throat> There's a plot of uh, a required uh, uh, inversion depth versus frequency, and that comes from the AWRL UHF microwave experimenters manual. Uh, I see here I have a, <laughs> in the second bullet, that should be 450 kilometers, 450 meters, not kilometers. I'll have I'll correct that in the PDF that I'm going to send you. Well, it's terrible when you correct when you when you find errors as you're doing a presentation. But oh well, every once in a while that happens. Now, one way to uh, maybe get a little heads up on a uh, tropospheric ducting is to look at the Hepburn tropo maps, and there's the URL there. Uh, www.dxinfocenter.com slash tropo.html. Again, uh, I'll send this PDF so you don't have to copy that down. And what uh, Hepburn does is gives uh, uh, his prediction for uh, ducting. And here I pulled this one, uh, let's see, uh, May 18th. That's today at 1800 UTC, which would be uh, uh, 2 p.m. here locally in Fort Wayne, so that'd be uh, 
uh, one to 11 a.m. Uh, out your way. And the color code is uh, the reddish means a very high likelihood of uh, tropospheric ducting. You can see that was happening off the coast of Texas in the, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, uh, <clears throat> some probability uh, you know, in the Midwest, but not too much. Okay, that SSSP, short path summer solstice propagation. Uh, that was a hypothesis by JE1BMG, BMJ in his article in the Six News. Uh, and it's tied to polar mesospheric summer echoes, PMSE. Uh, those are radar echoes between 80 and 90 kilometers uh, in, in mid-May through mid-August in the Arctic. Uh, the peak PMSE height is slightly below the summer mesopause, uh, and it's around 88 kilometers, and it's above, uh, you, maybe you've read about noctilucent clouds that are down a little bit lower. Now, one of the interesting things is how do you tell the difference between uh, polar mesosphere summer, summer echo propagation and sporadic E propagation? There's uh, the lower, uh, on the right there, that lower chart is when uh, PMSE occurs. And you can see it's mid-May to mid-August, and that's about when uh, <laughs> sporadic E occurs. So uh, again, it's a hypothesis by JE1BMJ. I'm not sure we'll ever prove anything because we just don't have data to, to help uh, settle what, what's really going on up there. Okay, uh, the electron density, of course, that's what refracts the signal back to Earth, those free electrons. And uh, uh, data from uh, some technical papers shows that, yeah, there's enough, uh, there's enough ionization uh, around or in the polar mesosphere summer echo to refract uh, six meters. So it certainly can happen. Um, I'm not sure, like I said, I'm not sure we'll ever prove uh, what's going on, but all we can do is try and take that and match it to some of the, prob the probabilities we uh, kind of understand and all this stuff. Another mode, meteor scatter. Um, K1JT has the MSK144 for meteor scatter. There's the major meteor showers in 2022. So if you're interested in that mode, um, there's some good stuff coming up. You'll probably need to read, run some power and also have some uh, good, uh, good antennas, but uh, that should happen because there's a heck of a lot of meteors around us, a lot of debris. Okay, Aurora, you're probably familiar with Aurora. Um, <clears throat> generally, when the K index is greater than five, the K index is uh, the three hour indication how active the Earth's magnetic field is. Uh, so there's eight K indices every day. Uh, point your antenna northish. And probably the best thing to do is use CW. Uh, and now uh, Aurora in that view of the top of the world is kind of perpendicular to the auroral zone. Uh, you can see that uh, the auroral zone is. Um, most highly active in the midnight sector, which, uh, which is in the dark side of the earth, of course. Now, auroral E, uh, that's a path that would be tangential to the auroral oval as indicated on that chart. Um, it happens on 15 and 10 meters in the late afternoon in the fall months. And um, perhaps it happens on six meters. I've not seen anything, but uh, who knows? Okay, there's also ionospheric, just pure ionospheric scatter. Uh, our normal view of refraction is if the operating frequency is less than the MUF, it comes back down to Earth. If the operating frequency is greater than the MUF, it goes through and off into space, never to return. 
But what really could happen is some of the signal is scattered. Most of it goes through, some of, some of it is scattered back to the ground. Um, that's loosely referred to as an above the MUF mode. It's got more loss, but uh, well, that's okay. We'll talk about this in a little bit more in, in a couple slides. Uh, you, you know, there are just regular EHOPs. Uh, generally, that's probably going to have to be around the equatorial ionosphere because it's the most robust portion of the uh, worldwide ionosphere, and that's where uh, there'd be enough E region ionization to refract 50 megahertz. Sporadic E, well, that's, uh, uh, you've probably heard, I'm sure you've heard of that. It's called sporadic because we can't predict on which days it will occur. We have some uh, good idea of the general patterns. And that's what that uh, image on the right is. <clears throat> the, the bottom horizontal axis is months for two years, 1957 and 1958. So it's kind of old data, but it's uh, still very relevant. And it's not out of date. The vertical axis is local time. And the contour lines are probabilities of uh, sporadic E happening. So you can see in the summer months, the best time for sporadic E is in the late morning and the early evening. Now, don't forget that uh, uh, the probability during the summer in between the late morning and early late evening doesn't go to zero. There's still a probability, so don't uh, give up. You know, look in between also. And uh, it, it's interesting that the uh, the bimodal probability, you know, being late morning and early evening, that can allow long distance QSOs. In fact, here's some, uh, we, we can even predict some of that. Um, for example, here's the path from N0JK in Kansas to JA7 in early June. Uh, what I did is I broke the path up into five segments, five hops. So, so that means each hop's going to be a little bit less than 2,000 kilometers. Then I can use the probabilities on the previous slide for each segment, for each hop versus local time. I can multiply them together. And there's the probability of Kansas working JA uh, versus time, local time versus time, yeah, versus UTC. And you can see that uh, uh, there's a strong probability, right, at oh, about 0100 UTC. And uh, N0JK worked JA7 at uh, 2345. So that worked out pretty good. We can carry that even far farther. Uh, N4KZ in Kentucky worked CT3 in June. Again, I broke the path up into uh, four segments, and I used the probabilities on the uh, earlier slide for each of the four hops, and that's what the probability came out on the right there. Now, you can see that it's bimodal. And uh, N4KZ worked them at 2208 UTC. So that, that says that's pretty interesting. And uh, at first I kind of wondered about that, but uh, I talked to other Midwest stations and they confirmed that there are two opportunities to work Europe. So, uh, you know, when it's, uh, when it's a late morning in uh, the US, it's early evening over in Europe. So. Yeah, that works out pretty good. And here's here's something for field day coming up. This is for W7 to W2. W6 to W2 is probably uh, pretty close. Um, <clears throat> it's a bimodal um, probability. So uh, make sure uh, when you're at field day, if you've got a six meter station, make sure you're on around uh, six, uh, 18 UTC plus or minus a couple hours. And oh, I don't know, 03 UTC plus or minus a couple hours. And don't forget in between, like at 2200, uh, there, there may be some good stuff there. Okay, what about sporadic E? Has it changed over the years? And that's pretty interesting to look at. The map on the left is from uh, the late 50s. 
and it shows uh, where sporadic E occurred. And what I did in red is highlight the uh, maximum probabilities. You can see that uh, um, uh, the one, one of them is uh, over JA there on the left. One is in Northern Canada and one is over uh, Northern Africa, Southern Europe. Now we can compare that to uh, more recent data. For example, 2002 using uh, uh, GPS signals. And it sure looks like ES has shifted west from JA into Southeast Asia. <laughs> and it looks like North America shifted too. Now, the, the big question is how good is that old data uh, back in the late 50s? So, uh, don't know what to say, but it's interesting stuff to look at. Now, there also seems to be a tie between sporadic E and weather in the troposphere. Um, uh, there's a lot of recent work by uh, G3YLA. He's a retired BBC meteorologist in K1YOW. Uh, 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 G3YLA generates daily ES prediction index, and we'll take a look at that on the next slide. K1YOW had a great article in CQ, and uh, they're, they're both tied to events that happen in the troposphere. Uh, for example, uh, something about the jet stream or something else. And here's uh, G3YLA's EPI, uh, uh, sporadic E prediction index. And he's color coded it there on the left. Uh, the uh, probability of sporadic E, uh, of course, is greater uh, the more reddish the area is. And we're looking at uh, uh, mostly Europe there, kind of in the right half of that uh, colorful plot. And what I did is I compared uh, who was working who at the same time on the same date in Europe using dxmaps.com. And you can see there's, there's somewhat of a good correlation. So, uh, see, did I, uh, yeah, I gave you the URL for where you can look at that, uh, that colorful prediction. So you can take a look whenever, uh, you know, wherever you want to, and maybe uh, see, you can scroll the map over to North America too. So it's not that he just looks at Europe. And, uh, might give you an indication that, hey, I better get on six meters because stuff is happening. And don't forget 10 meters too. Sporadic E uh, happens there also. There's sporadic E by latitude. This comes from uh, Ionospheric Radio by Kenneth Davies. Uh, the top is the auroral zone. ES is mostly a nighttime event. The uh, middle plot is the middle latitudes where we kind of live. And uh, it's very similar to the probabilities we saw earlier in slide 21. And then the equatorial zone has lots of ES, mostly around local noon. So uh, any path that crosses the equator around local noon, sh local noon should consider sporadic E. F2 hops, uh, just like E hops, uh, there has to be a certain amount of ionization to refract 50 megahertz back to Earth. And it has to be quite high and more, more than likely it's going to happen around solar maximum in the fall and winter months. So uh, that's why uh, uh, we should always uh, pay attention to the upcoming solar maximum in the fall and winter months. Transequatorial propagation, that's probably one of the best known. Uh, extremely long paths across the magnetic equator. Um, there, there's what happens there at the bottom left. Uh, the ray goes up and then it's refracted a little bit and it parallels the earth and then it's refracted back down and that can be, you know, 5,000 kilometers or so. There are uh, basically four general transequatorial paths uh, from the Caribbean to the deep South America from Southern uh, Southern Europe into Southern Africa, from uh, JA down to Northern VK, and the Caribbean into the uh, Eastern Atlantic. 
there, 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 you know, there has to be people. <laughs> and that's uh, where the big ones are. Uh, ducting, cordal hops, there's just a little, I'll let you guys look at that later. I'll look, I'll let you look at that. I mentioned, I talked about that above the MUF mode. Uh, when the operating frequency is slightly above the MUF, we still can have a QSO. Um, now there's going to be some extra loss and there's the third bullet kind of shows uh, estimations by th three different groups on uh, how much loss there is, how much extra loss uh, when the uh, operating frequency is 50 megahertz and the MUF is down at 40 megahertz. So uh, I'm not sure we've pinned this down good enough to say what happens, but uh, it's interesting that it's probably has a lot to do with uh, FT8 being able to uh, uh, give us lots of QSOs where CW and sideband don't. Skewed pass. Uh, most of the time we, we think that RF follows a great circle path. And uh, <clears throat> sometimes it doesn't. One of the best examples I've seen, although it was on 10 meters, was the FT5 Zulu Mike the expedition. Uh, uh, back in 2014, they were in the uh, uh, in the uh, Southern Indian Ocean, and uh, there were uh, skewed paths from uh, uh, Colorado Station and also from uh, Florida Station. And by putting the Great Circle paths on a worldwide MUF chart, you can kind of guess where the uh, skew point was. Uh, so I'll, I'll, that's all I'll say, and I'll let you look at it. If you have any questions, <clears throat> again, uh, K9LA at ARRL. And the last one is six meter moon bounce. Now that's getting pretty interesting. W6, uh, W7GJ has an, a great, two great, has a great website. Also, there's another one, stationproject.blog. <clears throat> uh, it's getting started in EME. And uh, of course, you're going to need uh, generally lots of power, good antennas, although <laughs> the digital modes make that uh, a little bit easier, that's for sure. Now, if you want to know what's happening on six meters right now, what you can do is uh, uh, one thing you can go to dxmaps.com. I mentioned that earlier. Here I pull this one at uh, 16, about a little bit after noon today here in Fort Wayne. Um, you can see six meters had uh, uh, sporadic E going on. The legend for the modes is at the bottom. Red is sporadic E. You can see there was some sporadic E in uh, the Southern states even out to the West Coast. And in fact, there was even a, a QSO from the Eastern half of North America to, uh, to Europe. So <clears throat> take a look at dxmaps.com on any band you want to look at. And you can see what's going on. It might be worth uh, you know, taking a look at the band. You can also use PSK Reporter, WhisperNet, Reverse Beacon Networking, and figure out what's going on. Uh, KC2G has a, uh, a map of worldwide maximum usable frequencies. Uh, he downloads ionosan data every 15 minutes and then uh, adds contour lines. Pretty interesting picture. You can uh, kind of visualize in a great circle path and see what the MUF would be along that path. And it'll give you a, uh, probably a good indication of what may be happening. <clears throat> the Northern Cal DX Foundation uh, beacon system. Um, it's pretty good. Uh, there are 18 worldwide beacons on 2017, 15, 12, and 10. So in a three minute period, you can assess worldwide propagation on, on any of those bands. Pretty interesting. Also VE3NEA, Alex, he uh, uh, has developed software called Pharos. There's the URL way at the bottom. And what it does is uh, syncs up your uh, 
radio to your PC so you know in which 10 second slot uh, who's transmitting. So, and you, and you can collect data and analyze propagation, doing a heck of a lot of stuff. So, some antenna considerations on six meters. So, what elevation angles are required on six meters? Well, we can go through uh, uh, some some calculations, and and in general, at most. 15 to 20 degrees is the highest angle we can expect. If there's any angles higher, it's probably going to go right through the either the sporadic E uh, layer or the uh, F2 region. So in general, you, we want uh, elevation angles less than mm, 20 degrees or so. So how does that uh, how does that relate to uh, height above ground? Well, here's a bunch of uh, three element six meter Yagi elevation patterns. The one way on the left is at 20 feet. You can see it's, uh, it has a nice lobe with a maximum at 15 degrees. That's nah, not too bad. Uh, there's the 30 foot pattern. And as you go higher, you can see what happens is we get more and more nulls. Uh, there's more scalloping of the uh, elevation pattern. Now, W2BPV believed that the best height for an HF Yagi was one, was one and a half lambda. That's about 30 feet on six meters, and that should work out pretty good. It covers, uh, you know, the low angles up to 15 pretty good. Of course, uh, if you have a high antenna, that may work very well, too, for the extremely low elevation angles. Uh, but it'd still be good to have one down lower. <clears throat> down at uh, 30 feet or so. So a quick summary, uh, six meters is, a, is affected the most by the solar cycle of all the VHF, UHF bands. Uh, I think we can expect six meter uh, sideband and CW openings via the F2 region around cycle 25 maximum in the fall and winter months. We should expect uh, FT8 openings earlier and later than sideband and CW. In fact, I was just looking tonight and saw some spots uh, for uh, a six meter FT8. Always watch for spikes in the solar flux and the sunspot number and spikes in the K index because you may be rewarded with some short term enhanced condition. And of course you can, uh, monitor the solar flux or the sunspot number in a various number of places. Uh, sporadic E doesn't appear to cor doesn't appear to matter where we are in a solar cycle. So uh, it's gonna happen just about any <laughs> yeah, solar min, solar max on the ascent, on the descent. And of course, FT8 is gonna have a definite advantage over CW and sideband. Now, the problem is trying to get people off FT8 and to get them onto CW and sideband. <clears throat> and as we saw, there are many six meter modes. You may try some of them, you may like them uh, more than just FT8, CW, and sideband. Here's some references <clears throat> books, papers, websites, videos, columns. Uh, K6MIO has a great, uh, not a good number of papers on six meter propagation. K5ND has a uh, an ebook. Uh, WB2AMU, WB6NOA has a VHF propagation, a practical guide for radio amateurs, available through CQ. There's the UK six meter group. EI7GL has a blog. Uh, uh, G0KYA. Steve talks about uh, <clears throat> six meter propagation. He's an RSGB guy. Of course, the propagation chapters in the handbook and the antenna book. N0JK, I mentioned him earlier. He writes the world above 50 megahertz in QST and also VHF UHF contesting in uh, NCJ. <clears throat> in CQ magazine, uh, VHF plus column is written by N4DPF. 
in the recently G3 XTT had a presentation on six meters and there's the uh, URL for it. <clears throat> I know there are many, many more sources of six meter propagation information and I just can't list them all. That's, that's all. <clears throat> Uh, here's some references for general propagation. Uh, Bob NM7M, he's a silent key. He wrote the Little Pistols Guide to HF Propagation. Very, very easy read. Um, it's not, it's out of print, but it's available on my website. It's a 15 meg file, which shouldn't be too much of a problem nowadays. <clears throat> And uh, as Patrick mentioned, the CQ Shortwave Propagation Handbook, fourth edition, was recently updated. Uh, you got to pay for that one. So, yeah, that's the way it goes. <laughs> so, that's all I had. Uh, if there are any questions, I hopefully I can maybe, uh, maybe answer them. Well, I was kind of amazed at the, uh, at the elevation charts, you know, the profiles that uh, over about 30 feet, you're not gaining any uh, improvement on the, uh, on the lobes at 15 degrees. I've got a four element six meter Yagi at 45 feet. And uh, I didn't realize I could probably do better if I lowered it. <laughs> well, okay, why isn't my, uh... there we go. Oh, there we go. Went past it. Right? Well, there there are times if if the signal's coming in at very low angle that that high antenna is going to beat anything else you've got. Yeah. So it's it's probably really good to have two antennas, one up high, one down low, and have a switch so you can do uh, both or upper or lower. Well, that that surprised me. <laughs> Yeah. I have been successful. Anybody else have questions? I may after reading the PDF. <laughs> there you go. Yep. I've got a lot of reading to do in order. Boy, yeah, I you too. Mm -hmm. Just got a, I just see an email here. It says, uh, hi all, turn on six meters. It is opening up. <laughs> That's from a VE7, so uh, maybe you guys ought to go listen to six meters. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Patrick, add at least one tower to the property and you'll be fine. There you go. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with two. I think my wife will uh, be unhappy at three. <laughs> uh, there has to be some more th six meter enthusiast questions. Oh, well, not hearing any questions, Carl. We want to thank you very much for okay. joining us. No uh, problem. Your, your presentation was wonderful. And uh, we do appreciate the fact that you stayed up late in order mm -hmm. to, uh, to honor us at 7 p.m. Pacific time. <laughs> yeah, no problem.